I think we should get started. Uh, hello and uh, hello to everybody. Um, I would like to uh, introduce uh, our speaker, Doug Arnold, first by thanking him for uh, giving uh, what is uh, an early morning uh, lecture for him. Uh, Doug uh, is professor at uh, the University of uh, Minnesota, where he holds the um, McKnight Presidential Chair in the School of Mathematics, and uh, is a world-known expert in uh, numerical analysis uh, of partial differential equation. Um, he uh, became quite famous for having uh, introduced and developed uh, what's now uh, known as finite element uh, exterior calculus, which is a, in a way a discrete version of the classical exterior uh, calculus, which is quite uh, helpful in understanding, uh, uh, analyzing uh, finite element methods in various areas, mechanics, uh, fluids, and electromagnetism. Uh, I want to also say that Doug is very uh, dedicated to the to the community, to the applied math community, because he served uh, as uh, president of uh, SIAM. He has directed also the IMA, the Institute at University of uh, Minnesota. And he's also quite um, uh, eager also to support new uh, editorial uh, models, uh, open access journals. I want to mention this because uh, he, uh, he has uh, been uh, very, helpful uh, in becoming the, um, the editor-in-chief of the, the first of his journal uh, edited by uh, SMAI, which is my journal of, uh, um, of um, mathematics. Of, uh, oh. Computational mathematics. Yeah, computational mathematics. Thank you very much, Doug. <laughs> OK. Uh, and so now he's going to deliver a lecture on um, uh, where the, the, the title is complexes for, from complexes. And I think you will get to understand what it means uh, during the talk. Thank you. And uh, Doug, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much, Albert. Thanks to everybody for coming here. It's great to see so many old friends, but I must say, I prefer to be in Paris giving the lecture. It's, I guess, 18 years since I lectured at Jusso, so. It's great to be back in that sense. So as Albert said, uh, a lot of my work and what I'm gonna talk about today has to do with the finite element exterior calculus, which is a way to use the structure of exterior calculus to get stable numerical methods. So I'm gonna talk about the latest chapter of that endeavor, which is joint work with Kai Bo Hu, who is uh, my postdoc and is now a postdoc at Oxford. But I'm not going to assume that people are familiar with exterior calculus. Um, so I'm going to start by just, it's a big theory and there's no way I can sort of go over it all quickly in the beginning, but I'm just going to give a glimpse of, finite, of the basic theory of finite element exterior calculus. What is it to start the lecture? And then I'll get more into the structures involved, Hilbert complexes and the canonical example, the Duram complex. But the key, the topic for this lecture is new complexes other than the Duram complex and how they're brought into the picture and how you establish the properties you need of those complexes. And that's what the last two parts of the talk will be about. So what is finite element exterior calculus? I consider it the prime example of a structure preserving discretization method for partial differential equations, somewhat analogous to geometric integrators and symplectic integrators for ODEs, which capture a very important structure in ODEs. So FIC applies to lots of problems in PDEs that relate to exterior calculus and to, to a more general uh, structure called a Hilbert complex. So I'll define a Hilbert complex shortly, but basically it's a marriage between two things, the structure of a chain complex, which is an algebraic object and uh, functional analysis of Hilbert spaces that we're used to using in finite elements get married together in a Hilbert complex. And I hope 
that you'll be convinced, if not already, that it's a very rich structure, although it's fairly simple to define, it bring, it has a lot of implications. In particular, as a complex, it has cohomology. Uh, and because of the Hilbert space structure, it has a Hodge theory. And that draws a connection between PDEs and their well-posedness and the Hilbert complex structure. And in fact, these things like Hodge theory, they were designed to to develop and explore and prove the well-posedness of PD boundary value problems. And so it's not surprising that if you go down to the discrete level, then you, if you have the similar objects at the discrete level, you get well-posedness at the discrete level, which is another name for numerical stability. So finite element exterior calculus uh, designs discretizations that capture the structures of a Hilbert complex at the discrete level and uses that to achieve stable and convergent numerical methods. So the, the subject has become very big now. I guess it got started in some way when I gave a talk at the ICM in 2002, introduced these things, and that led to a collaboration with uh, Rick Falk of Rut Rutgers and Ragnar Winter of Oslo and two long papers, the one in Acta Numerica in 2006, mostly discussed the applications to the Duram complex. And then the Hilbert complex structure was introduced in the bulletin of the AMS in 2010. And now I didn't try to list other people working in the area. There are many, many contributions, many dozens of PhD theses, hundreds of authors writing papers on the subject altogether. But I have to point out some of the work that led, led to this work because it didn't come out of nowhere. There were basically two rivers flowing together. One was from the mixed finite element community like Ravi Artoma, Nedelec, uh, Hipmer, and Bosovit played a key role in noticing the connections to the topology river, which was totally independent but doing related things, in particular Whitney in his book in 1967, Dennis Sullivan, Dodzik, and Patodi. And the reference I would recommend um, is, some, is a short book that I published with Simon in 2018, um, which has the basic theory of finite element exterior calculus in a relatively accessible way. So let me try to motivated, why do we need the finite element exterior calculus by looking at a standard finite element problem and then one that needs it. So the standard one will just be the Laplacian and I don't have to, I could have taken a source problem but I took an eigenvalue problem. So our domain is this square annulus uh, and we wanna minimize the Rayleigh quotient, the Dirichlet integral subject to the, in, the L2 norm is one. And how do we do that with finite elements? Well, we use the Ritz method or the Galerkin method, basically the same thing. So we triangulate our domain and uh, on, take a space of functions to minimize over, which are piecewise polynomials on the triangulation, like piecewise linears drawn here. And we minimize over that. And if we do that with uh, 4,000 P1 finite elements, these are the first four eigenvalues we get. 9.279, et cetera, and the corresponding eigenfunctions. And it's well known that this method converges nicely. If you want to convince yourself, you could go to more elements or higher degree elements, or here's both 16,000 P4 elements, and the numbers settle down to uh, these numbers, which are the correct eigenvalues to within five places. Fine, so finite elements work, and many of us use it every day. What happens if I solve a very slightly different problem? Now u is a vector field and I wanna minimize the integral of curl u squared plus div u squared. That's the eigenvalue problem for the one form Laplacian or Hodge Laplacian. <coughs> so I do the same thing. I triangulate the domain. I take vector fields, which are piecewise linear or piecewise polynomial in each triangle. I minimize the Rayleigh quotient and with 4,000 P1 elements, I get these numbers and these eigenvectors that are shown. The problem is, this is completely wrong. The true eigenvalues, which I can compute using finite element exterior calculus elements, the first one is not 1.94 or anywhere near it, it's, it's zero. 
And in fact, that's a theorem that the first eigenvalue is zero. Uh, the second eigenvalue has a value of about 0.6, not 2.02. And you see the eigenfunctions look totally different also. You won't fix this problem by taking the standard method and refining the mesh. Here's a refinement study. I use P1 finite elements, and I'm plotting the first six eigenvalues with 64 triangles, 256 triangles, up to a million triangles. Everything nicely converges and settles down, but it converges to the wrong answer. We're getting this 2.1 instead of uh, zero, and instead of 0.6, we're getting a too large number and so forth. So the standard finite element method fails for this kind of problem. On the other hand, the FIC finite element method, which basically comes down to using different finite element spaces, then not just piecewise linears, that works perfectly. Everything converges nicely to the right answers. In particular, the zero eigenvalue that's there by a theorem, it's there because there's a hole in the domain and the zero, presence of a zero eigenvalue signals that hole, that's captured on the discrete level, even with a small number of elements. One more example I like, which is uh, I learned from Daniele Bofe and Lucia Gastaldi, is the Maxwell eigenvalue problem for uh, piecewise linear elements. So now we're just minimizing the curl u squared and looking at the positive eigenvalues, but uh, no hole, the hole is not the point of this example. I'll do this on a square for which we know the exact solution are the sums of positive squares of integers. So the, the lowest eigenvalue is one plus one. The next one is one plus four and four plus one and so forth. And here is a, the convergence results as we add more elements. And indeed the first eigenvalue is computed to be very close to two. And then one plus four is five and five again, and then six and then eight. But wait a second, six, is not the sum of two squares. In fact, two of the things that appear here are totally spurious eigenvalues. So again, standard finite elements cannot handle a problem like that. So this is the thing that finite element exterior calculus is designed to clarify and to explain. <coughs> <coughs> so what is the story? Well, a key result of the FIC, I'll call it FIC, are the conditions on the finite element spaces that you would need to discretize problems that arise from Hilbert complexes. Again, I'll get to a Hilbert complex, but the key requirements can be stated is that the discrete spaces, the Galerkin subspaces, themselves have to form a Hilbert subcomplex of the true complex, and there have to exist bounded commuting projections from the Hilbert complex onto the subcomplex. That's it. Those are the basic hypotheses of feet. They're, of course, refinements. But the difference between a numerical method that preserves the structure in the sense of these two conditions and another method is huge, as you saw, the difference between this and getting the right answer. Um, then comes the question, well, when I look at my particular PDE and the Hilbert complex associated with it, how do I find subspaces that form a Hilbert complex and have bounded commuting projections? Well, if the complex is the Duram complex, this has been studied in great depth now and it ties into the classical theory of mixed finite elements. And now it's basically complete and systematic. And it's been summarized in a table that Anders Log and I made called the periodic table, we call the periodic table of finite elements. These are the finite elements to use for the Duram complex. The Duram complex has differential forms of degrees zero, one through n in n dimensions. And these are the one dimensional elements, the two dimensional elements, the three dimensional elements. In each column, we have zero forms, one forms, two forms, a second family of zero forms, one form, two forms, and similar for the cubical elements. And we have different degrees, first degree, second degree, third degree. And this table could be extended to n dimensions and arbitrary degree. And the key thing about it, it's a very systematic approach. So let me show you what one of these little uh, table entries look like. This is the element we call P2 lambda 2 on a tetrahedron. Uh, <clears throat> the sh shape functions are polynomial two, two forms. The degrees of freedom are laid out here. How they're spread on the different faces is laid out. 
And besides the feet name, this is nothing other than the traditional metallic face element of the second kind of degree two. So to generate these systematically and get, and get their properties, that's what FIC is about. And all these different branches of mathematics actually plays a role in it. So it brings in a lot of structure again. In particular, I emphasize we use Hodge theory and, and um, chain complexes, of course. We also make use of the Kazool complex that's crucial to designing elements, chain homotopies. And today's talk will have a big reliance on something called the bernstein gelfand gelfand resolution. And I'll quickly show this is pieces of the table and how they relate to mixed finite elements. This is one family of elements for zero forms, one forms, two forms, and 3D three forms uh, of different degrees. The first row is nothing other than the familiar Lagrange elements. Zero forms are just uh, H1 functions. <coughs> The last row, the last column in each row are discretizes L2, and these are the usual DG elements, but the Raviar-Toma elements show up here for the one forms in 2D, and the Nedelec face and edge elements show up there. So we've basically systemized and organized known elements <coughs> in this case. <coughs> There's something similar for the second family of elements. And in this picture, you have the Lagrange elements, the DG elements, the BDM elements, the Nedelec elements, and <coughs> of the second kind. <coughs> and then I also wanted to point out the, the lowest order elements were actually the ones discovered by Whitney back in 57, and it's not for, not for numerics, but for topology. Okay, so that's my quick glimpse of finite, of finite element exterior calculus. Now let's get into what is a Hilbert complex and the example of the Duram complex. So on, take a bounded Lipschitz domain in Rn, although you could more generally take a manifold. And a complex is just a sequence of vector spaces with linear operators from one to the next. And here the vector spaces are the space of all differential zero forms going by the exterior derivative operator to differential one forms, et cetera. And a differential K form is nothing other than a smooth function that takes values <clears throat> in alternating uh, rank K tensors. So the first space is just C infinity functions, standard functions. The second space is C infinity vector fields or more exactly co-vector fields, they uh, functions on vectors, the dual space of vectors. And the next one would be C infinity functions into skew symmetric matrix fields, into skew symmetric uh, bilinear forms and so forth. So it's a simple object. That's the Duram complex. And the key structure that makes it a complex is if you do the exterior derivative twice in a row, you get zero. I didn't say what the exterior derivative is, the first one that takes a function to a vector field is just the gradient. The second one is just the curl. So you get curl gradient to zero and so forth. And they can be defined systematically. So what the, first, the main thing that you get out of a complex and the reason for the existence of complexes is from this d squared is zero, you get the null space of the second d contains as a subspace the range of the first d and you can consider the quotient space, the difference and that's the cohomology group. And the dimension of that group is the most fundamental topological invariant of the domain. It's the number of holes, k-dimensional holes in the domain. So for example, for k equals one on this pretzel, this hk would be of dimension three because there are three holes in the, in the pretzel. <clears throat> so that's what a topologist uses the Duram complex for at, at the basic level. And then just use it, this, I, we have a choice whether at least in 3D, whether we use exterior calculus language, differential forms, or just C infinity functions, C infinity vector fields, grads, curls, and divs. And I'll move back between those. I write C infinity tensor V for vector valued smooth functions. Okay, in FIC, this is not the form of the Duram complex we actually work with. We work with a variant of it. Um, which I'll get to in a moment. But first, let me make some relation 
let me point out that there are other complexes with a similar structure. So the Duram complex underlies lots of PDAs in math physics, the ones that you can make from divs, grads, and curls in 3D. So the Laplacian, which is div grad, the heat equation, which is the time uh, dependent version of the Laplacian, and the wave equation, the nonlinear variance of that. Uh, the next one that involves grad, um, curl, and div gives you Maxwell equations in the same way that the, the first spaces give you the wave equation, magneto hydrodynamics, and so forth. And the last spaces that center around div gives you Darcy flow, div curl problems, and so forth. But of course, there are other PDEs that don't just involve divs and grads and curls. So for example, there's elasticity that involves the symmetric gradient operator. And there's plate theory that involves the biharmonic operator and so forth. Well, the <coughs> biharmonic plays, uh, comes up as just like the Laplacian comes up for the integral of the gradient squared the biharmonic comes up with the integral of the Hessian squared. And there's a complex that instead of the gradient has the Hessian. It starts with C infinity functions, takes the Hessian to get C infinity uh, symmetric matrix fields. Take the curl of one of those. The curl of a symmetric matrix field is a trace-free matrix field. And the divergence of a trace-free matrix field is a vector field. This is a nice complex itself that has a lot of similar structure to Duram. And we're also interested in discretizing this and using it in uh, finite element exterior calculus. It's valuable not only for the plate theory, but also for uh, GR. The Einstein-Bianchi equations of GR exactly are based on, when you linearize them, the curl operator from symmetric to trace-free matrices. <clears throat> Another complex is the elasticity complex, which is one of the things that got me into uh, this su subject. Um, that starts with vector fields and takes the symmetric gradient, what I call the def deformation, to symmetric matrix fields. And then the incompatibility operator or San Vinan operator, which is the curl transpose curl operator from a symmetric matrix field to another. And then the matrix diversion on symmetric matrix fields to vector fields. This lines up very well with elasticity with the displacement in the first space the strain in the second space, the stress in the third space, and the load in the fourth space. And there are a bunch of other complexes. <clears throat> so basically the story is for the Duram complex, we understand most everything and we have a periodic table of finite elements, but we have much less complete understanding of these other complexes and they're done much less systematically. And this work is a step to trying to resolve that. <coughs> So I said there's other versions of the Duram complex that were used, two others in particular. One is the Sobolev Duram complex. And in this case, we use the Sobolev spaces. So not C infinity differential forms, but HS differential forms. And we capture the notion that D is a D grad or curl or div is the first order differential operator by lowering the Sobolev index as we move across the, to the right. And one question is, what's the cohomology of this complex? Is it the same as you get with smooth functions? Does it depend on S? There could be subtle regularity questions in there. And that it, pro problem is answered along with a lot others in a beautiful, important paper by Martin Costabel and Alan McIntosh from 2010, which says, no, the cohomology is uniform among S on any bounded Lipschitz domain omega. You can choose spaces of C infinity functions, K forms, finite dimensional, um, which represent the cohomology in the sense that the null space of D on HS is just the range of D on HS plus one plus the same cohomology space. And of course its dimension then gives you the, the Betty numbers and so forth of the domain. It'll turn out that the implications of this theory, theory are huge. They're exactly what we needed to uh, understand other Hilbert complexes. And so that's what I'll be talking about later today. And finally, this is the version of the Duram complex that actually we use in those papers on finite element exterior calculus, the L2 Duram complex. In that case, all the spaces are L2 
differential forms. So they have a nice Hilbert space norm with them, but the operators are unbounded because of course the gradient of an L2 function is not necessarily an L2 function. Instead, it's only defined on those L2 functions whose gradient is in an L2, or that would be H1, or those L2 vector fields whose curl is in L2, that would be H curl and so forth. So the D is now only densely defined. It's not a bounded operator, it's a closed operator. And you can easily show as a consequence of um, the, the cohomology being the same on the Sobolev Duram complexes that you get the same cohomology again on the L2 Duram complex. But what you get out of using the L2 inner product that's extremely important is you get a dual complex. You can do duality with respect to the L2 inner product and define the adjoints of the exterior derivative which are maps going in the opposite direction. And that allows us to bring in elliptic PDE. If we start at one of these spaces, we can take the D operator and move to the right, and then the D star and move back to the left, or we could do the opposite and move to the left with D star, and then back to the right with D. And if you add them together, you get an elliptic operator. So one elliptic operator at each level, and that's called the Hodge Laplacian. We saw already in that first example, the one form Hodge Laplacian uh, didn't behave so well with ordinary finite elements. The zero form Hodge Laplacian is just a scalar Laplacian and does. And once of course you get the Hodge Laplacian, then you get the heat equation, the wave equation and all sorts of other variants. So to analyze either the PDEs or the numerical methods, you need properties of this Hilbert complex and the crucial one turns out to be that it's closed. Closed means that all the D operators have closed range. By the closed range theorem, it means also the D star operators have closed range. The Duram complex is closed. We'll see how to prove that as a consequence of Costa Bell Macintosh. And the, once you know that the complex is closed, it has many, many crucial consequences. For example, now the range of D is a subspace of the null space of the next D. That means it, that uh, it has an orthogonal complement, uh, which we'll call H, the harmonic forms. And then we also have duality. The orthogonal complement of the null space of D in L2 is the range of D star by duality using the fact that the range of D star is closed. You put these two things together and you get the L2 space is the range of D plus the harmonic forms plus the range of D star. That's an orthogonal decomposition. That's the Hodge decomposition, which as we all know is a very powerful tool. It comes directly from having a closed Hilbert complex, nothing else. You also get the Poincaré inequality that U is bounded by DU in L2, as long as U is or orthogonal to the null space of D. And out of these two things, the Hodge decomposition and the Poincaré inequality, you can prove that the Hodge Laplacian is uh, a well posed boundary value problem, but well posed exactly up to the harmonic forms. You have to put uh, for each harmonic, each harmonic form, you have to put a condition on F. So you have, if harmonic forms is three dimensional, there are three side conditions on F, and U is determined up to addition of a harmonic form. And now you can see sort of what the what's behind finite element exterior calculus. This structure, closed Hilbert complex, that's what leads to well-posedness of elliptic PDEs. If you want to discretize the elliptic PDEs, you need something to make them well-posed, that is stable. And what you want to do is you want to capture these same structures at the discrete level to get stability. So how, does, uh, how do you get a closed range out of the Costa Bell Macintosh theorem? Well, finite dimensional cohomology implies closed range, uh, which is good because otherwise closed range can be hard to prove. So here's a theorem. I learned it from Hormander volume three, but it's, I don't think it's so exotic. You have a bounded linear operator on between Banach spaces or Hilbert spaces, and its range is finite co-dimensional. Then the range is closed. So using that, if you have three spaces in a row and two operators and you look at the homology, cohomology at Y, that's uh, 
if the cohomology is finite dimensional, that means S is finite co-dimensional in the null space of T. That means the range of S is closed in the null space of T, so it's closed in Y. So the basic conclusion is whenever we can prove finite dimensional cohomology, we'll get closed range automatically. Okay, more consequences of the Kostovel Macintosh theorem. Um, well, I just said the co cohomology dimensions are finite. They don't depend on the smoothness. That's what the theorem says. Uh, that means all the Sobolev Duram complexes are closed. The L2 Duram complex is closed. I already showed you once we know the L2 complex is closed, we use that and duality, get harmonic forms, Hodge decomposition, Poincare inequality, well posedness of the Hodge Laplacian. We can also get that the potentials are regular. That's part of the Costa Bell Macintosh theorem. Uh, we can get a so called regular decomposition, uh, which I won't go into, which is a smooth Hodge decomposition. We can prove a compactness property. And I just want to emphasize that all these things are needed for the analysis of finite element methods. And they've, for the Duram complexes, they've been proven in the literature, but sort of on an ad hoc case by case basis. And I want to emphasize that they all come from the finite dimensionality of the cohomology. Okay, so that was sort of reviewing the basic, some of the basic ideas into, of FIC and what the structure that we're trying to preserve is. Now I want to talk about new complexes, uh, which is the main uh, contribution of this work with Kaibo. So what other complexes are there? I showed you a couple of them, the Hessian complex and the elasticity complex. Why those? Is that all the complexes there are? are there, is there some way of generating them and so forth? Then when you get one of those complexes, like the elasticity complex is a complex I've known for a long time, and I've known it's crucial to finite elements for elasticity, but I didn't quite know how it was related to other complexes like Duran. In particular, I didn't know how to easily prove things like it was closed and these other properties. Um, so in this paper, we're inspired by something called the BGG resolution. This is something I learned from a geometer, Mike Eastwood, and also Andreas Kopp in uh, Vienna has been very helpful in explaining BGG to me and Kai Bo. And so we're not gonna use it, but we were inspired by that work to give a systematic derivation of numer numerous complexes in N dimensions, including elasticity and Hessian, for example. So the basic idea is you start with two complexes that satisfy certain assumptions. For example, they might be Duram complexes. And then you construct a new complex and, and it, as a con consequence of the general theory, it inherits the properties of the original complexes. In particular, the cohomology of the output complex is always less in dimension than the sum of the cohomologies of the original complexes. So that means if the original complexes had finite dimensional cohomology, we get that for free and all it implies. And with some more assumptions, we actually get equality rather than less than or equal to. I won't go into that right now. Okay, <clears throat> so there's gonna be sort of four technical slides here or I won't go in, into the technical aspects but they're technical nonetheless. So here's a good time to take a breath and uh, we'll get our morning exercise. It's morning for me. So the input to this process is you start with two complexes and you wanna generate a new complex, a third one. The complexes are bounded Hilbert complexes like the sobolev duram complexes. In fact, they will in many cases be sobolev duram complexes. But here I've just written an abstract, some Hilbert space Z0 by some bounded linear operator D0 to Z1 and so forth. So I have one of those and then I have another one with tildes over it, Z0 tilde, D0 tilde. These spaces have a structure. They're basically have the structure of these uh, sobolev duram complex spaces. They're an infinite dimensional Hilbert space V, ZK is VK, tensored with a finite dimensional Hilbert space. So EK might be scalars or vectors or three by three matrices or something like that. 
VK might be a Sobolev space, HS, and we take their tensor product. What's more, the Vs are not independent of each other. The VK and V tilde K are the same, except there's an indexing offset. V tilde K is VK plus one. So the V part of the Hilbert space here is the same as the V part of the Hilbert space here and similarly going up diagonally. Okay, so it seems a little crazy, not super well motivated, but we saw some examples of things like this. So now I need one more input. I need for the E space on the bottom row to the E space diagonally up on the top row, I need a linear operator. So I'm requiring a linear operator SK from E tilde K to EK plus one. That lets me define a map from the whole Hilbert space diagonally up to the next one by just tensoring with the identity because V tilde zero is the same as V1. So I get these linking maps that go from the bottom complex diagonally up to the top complex. And I have requirements on these linking maps. Two things, the, the S operator, let me show the second one first. The S operators have to be injective on the left side of the diagram and surjective on the right side of the diagram. So I pick one level J, capital J, and for K less than or equal to J, the S's are injective and for K greater than or equal to J, they're surjective. Of course, that means for J itself, they're bijective. And the other thing is these little parallelograms you see in the diagram have to commute or actually anti-commute. D of S has to be minus S of D tilde. Okay, so those are the assumptions, a little bit heavy. Now, what do we do with those assumptions? I'm now going to take this diagram and extract a new sequence out of it in two steps. First, I'm gonna take the first J plus one spaces, zero, one through J on the top sequence. And they were VI tensor EI and I'm gonna reduce EI to a subspace F or EK to a subspace FK, where FK is the range of the incoming S orthogonal complement. So I go back to the previous slide. I take this space, I look at the range of the S coming in, which really means the range of the little S coming into E1, and I take its orthogonal complement and I call that F1, and so reduce the space V tensor E to V tensor F. And I do that in the first half of the top sequence up to level J. I do the same thing on the bottom half, on the right half of the bottom complex, except that when I, the F tilde I reduce to is now the null space of the S coming out of the E. So I reduce E to tilde K to F tilde K, which is the null space of SK. So now I have these two half sequences, one going from zero to the J space on the top and one going from the J plus first to the nth space on the bottom. And now I wanna splice these together. I wanna to draw an arrow that starts with this J space on top and goes to this J plus one space on bottom. And that's easy to do through a piece of the original diagram. This is a piece of that original two row diagram. And remember we assumed that at the level J, SJ is a bijection. So I can go across with D, down with SJ inverse, and across with D tilde the J and get an operator to splice these together. That is the construction. That's our sort of interpretation or adaptation of the BGG construction. So just summarize it. Start with the two complexes in the right form. Put in linking maps that satisfy the anti-commutativity and the J surjectivity injectivity conditions, reduce the spaces and splice them together and you get the new complex. Okay, and so now there's two things that I wanna do in the rest of the talk. One is talk about the properties of this complex that came out. And then two is do some concrete examples and see what we get out of this. So the properties are mostly captured with two theorems of which maybe the most important is this top one. It talks about the cohomology of the output complex. It's bounded by the sums of the dimensions of the, the Kaif cohomology of the top complex is bounded by the sum in dimension by the sum of the Kaif dimension of the Kaif cohomology 
of the two input complexes. So if the two input complexes have finite dimensional cohomology, the output complex does too. And we get equality if we have a certain condition on the linking maps, which I won't go into. Uh, and then with another assumption, which I also won't go into, we get a, an actual isomorphism between the cohomologies of the output complex and the input complexes. Okay, so what is all that good for? That's the final part of the talk will then be to apply that. So the first family of applications, I have to give you two input complexes and uh, linking maps and check surjectivity, injectivity, and uh, the anti-commutivity. For the input complexes, I'm gonna take the sobolev duram complex, but I'm gonna tensor it with all J, with alternating J, rank J tensors, and all J plus one. So those give me two complexes. So this first complex is all J valued zero forms, go to all J valued one forms and so forth. That's a sobolev duram complex. It's, for example, let's say J was one, then all J is basically Rn. So this is like N copies of the Duram complex added together. And we have something similar for the next one with all J plus one. So this fits exactly in our structure because remember what SH lambda K is, it's the Sobolev space SH tensored with all K. So this, down here on the, in the first complex, we have a Sobolev space tensored with all K, tensored with all J. So I take the V to be the Sobolev space and E to be the all K tensored with all J. Then I need a linking map from this space to this space uh, with um, I one higher. So what is this? This is multilinear maps, which are alternating in the first I entries and in the last J plus one entries. This is tensors of rank I plus J plus one that are alternating in the first I and the last J plus one indices. And I have to map that to tensors of the same rank, which are alternating the first I plus one indices and the last J indices. There's a natural way to do that. Just skew symmetrize with respect to the first I plus one indices. I've indicated here in sort of uh, differential geometry notation. I have a tensor which is anti-symmetric in the, these braced, bracket, braced indices. And then I anti-symmetrize with respect to the first I plus one indices. Okay, then it's a theorem, not so easy to prove. This is appendix in our paper of a couple of pages. I got a help from Vic Reiner, who's a combinatorist on proving this. Um, that says that these maps are injective if I is less than J and surjective if I is greater than J. So that gives me the injectivity surjectivity property and it's very easy to check the anti-commutativity property for these maps. Let me try to show what's going on in 3D. I'll show all the linking maps in 3D. So these are the E spaces if we take the Duram complex tensored with all zero, which is just a Duram complex, they're scalars, vectors, vectors, scalars. If we take the Duram complex tensored with vectors, we get vectors, vectors, tensor, vectors, matrices, matrices, vectors. In 3D, we also get vectors at the level of two forms, vectors, vectors, matrices, vectors, matrices, matrices, vectors, and back to scalars, vectors, vectors, scalars for three forms. And the diagonal maps, well, we need a map that maps a vector to a vector. We take the identity. We need a map that takes a vector to a matrix. Well, in 3D, if you use the cross product, a vector gives you a skew symmetric matrix. It's axial matrix. Uh, and I call that operator M skew. And similarly, if you have a matrix, you can take its skew symmetric part and get a vector. I call that V skew and so forth. Uh, this is the map that takes a scalar and puts it on the diagonal of a matrix, makes the diagonal matrix. This is the trace operator from a matrix to a scalar. And the other ones we've already seen. The S1 is the bijection on the, on the second level. And this is the map that takes a matrix to its transpose minus trace identity. And so we see that the red 
um, linking maps are in are bijections. The ones to their left are injections, and the ones to their right are surjections. So that gives us four, three choices of two of the first two rows, the second two rows, the third two rows, and we can apply our construction. So here I've drawn the picture also with the Sobolev spaces. We have the, the Duram complex, the vector value Duram complex, the vector value Duram complex, and the scalar value Duram complex have the linking maps we just discussed. And suppose I take the first two rows, then I have to reduce the spaces. So this one stays the same. This one becomes, instead of vectors, becomes ones orthogonal to skew symmetric matrices, thinking of a vector as a skew symmetric matrix. Uh, <clears throat> that gives me symmetric matrices. And I won't go through the whole derivation, but this new complex we get out is nothing other than the Hessian complex. It starts with Sobolev space HS. It drops down two orders to HS minus two via the Hessian. Then it goes from symmetric matrices to trace-free matrices via the curl, and from trace-free matrices to vector fields via the divergence. So if you're wondering where the Hessian complex came from, this is one way to think of where it came from, two Duram complexes. I can do that also with the next two Duram complexes and out pops the elasticity complex, precisely in the form I wrote it down before. Now we have a first order operators and a second order operator, not this time in the middle. And we can do the, th the third and fourth rows and we get another complex that we call the div-div complex. The first the first operator in here is the deviatoric part of the gradient, the trace-free part of the gradient, taking a vector field to a trace-free matrix field. The second part is a symmetric part of the curl operator, ending up in a symmetric matrix field. And then as a second op order operator, we have the divergence of the divergence operator ending up in a scalar field. So this is another complex that we can analyze using this uh, BGG kind of construction. I'm not done actually. It seems like I might be done. First two rows, second two rows, third two rows, but I can actually take the first row and the third row or the second row and the fourth row. If I take the first row and the third row, I compose two of the S operators and I get this grad curl complex. And each of these complexes is related to certain PDEs which, have, uh, which arise in mechanics. Um, the last two rows give me something called the curl div complex. And now you might think I were really done, but of course I could do the first row and the last row. And I get yet another complex, the grad div complex. Uh, and all of these have finite dimensional cohomology. So they're closed Hilbert complexes and give rise to a bunch of PDEs that we could consider. And we can keep going actually, because now we have new complexes and we can use those new complexes as input to this construction. So for example, if I take the elasticity complex and the Hessian complex, I get this thing, uh, which I've drawn down here. Here's the elasticity complex on top, the Hessian complex on the bottom. If I put them together, I get a new complex called the uh, cotton, uh, called the conformal elasticity complex. It starts with a vector field. It takes the deviatoric part of the strain tensor. So the symmetric, the trace-free part of the infinitesimal strain giving you a trace-free symmetric matrix. Then it applies a third order operator, um, which is uh, called the Cotton-York tensor, which is coming from the curl following the incompatibility tensor. So it's curl, of curl T curl, it has three curls in it. That gets you another symmetric trace free tensor whose divergence gives you a vector field. And this cotton York tensor, this arises in relativity, this has appeared before, but I wanna focus for a second on dev, de, dev def, the deviatoric strain tensor. This is a closed Hilbert complex. And so it has a Poincare inequality at every level in particular, we can show that a vector field is bounded by the L2 norm of the vector field is bounded by the L2 norm of its deviatoric strain, as long as it's orthogonal to the null space of the deviatoric strain. 
that's a 12 dimensional space, I think, that can be identified. So you get uh, a plant, a corn's inequality, or here's another form of the cor corn's inequality that you get. This is stronger than the usual corn's inequality, which doesn't have the dev here, has the whole strain tensor, not just the uh, trace-free part of it. So that comes, and this is not only a strengthened corn's inequality, but a proof of corn's inequality and the strengthened form comes directly out of this theory. You don't need any tricky analysis. The only analysis went into the properties of the Duram complex, which we already know. Okay, and finally, I'll end up talking, I've talked about the PDEs and the structure of these structure preserving discretizations. I haven't talked much about discretization and that work is not complete yet. So coming up with the finite, um, sorry, with the periodic table of finite elements for the Hessian complex and for the elasticity complex is sort of work in progress. But let me give you an example of a case that's completely done, which is the 2D elasticity complex. One example of how you would get finite elements from known finite elements, for, uh, get finite elements for this new complex. So this is the complex that we're interested in dealing with. It's the two dimensional version of the elasticity complex. The final operator is the divergence operator from symmetric matrices to vector fields from stresses to loads. And the first operator is the analog of the San Vinan operator in 2D, which is called the ARI operator, the curl curl, takes a scalar function and gives you a divergence free stress tensor. So now the idea is to get a stable numerical method for this. Of course, for mixed finite elements, we're mostly worried about getting subspaces of the last two spaces for the stresses and the displacements. But uh, what we need is, the theory tells us what we need is to get subspaces for all three spaces, which have bounded commuting projections. And <clears throat> We do that by looking to where, from where this, sub, where this complex came from and trying to reduce the properties of this complex to simpler complexes that we understand. The simpler complexes are the Duram complexes in 2D, which here, instead of writing as uh, grad and curl, I wrote as curl and div. That's the scalar curl in 2D. In 2D. And uh, this is the standard Duram complex in 2D on the top. And on the bottom, the vector value Duram complex. And the linking maps going up are the identity is the bijection. And to the right of it is the skew symmetric part of a matrix, which in 2D is a scalar. OK, and then we do the, our, our uh, BGG construction with reduction and splicing to get out this complex here. So now let's look at this on the discrete level. So we have a lot of spaces we have to discretize all these H2, H1 vector fields, L2, H1 vector fields again, L2 matrix fields, H minus one vector fields. So for H2, we do the simplest thing. That's an ancient question in finite elements. What elements can I use for H2? And the simplest answer is to use uh, the Argyris quintix. I've written down the element diagram here for the Argyris quintix that'll be used in HD. For H1, we use some elements that had been, well, this whole sequence on the top had already been developed, starting with Argyris, by Falk and Neeland when they were coming up with finite elements for so, something called the Stokes complex, which is a smooth Duram complex that you need to discretize Stokes and Navier Stokes. So they had a, after P5 here, they took the curl, they want a P4 space, but this space has extra smoothness at the vertices. So they took a P4 with extra smoothness at the vertices. It's C1 at the vertices, C0 on the edges. Um, those are the Hermite quartex. And then in the last space, they took a L2 space with extra smoothness, namely continuity at the vertices. Um, so that those spaces and the fact that they have nice relations to the continuous complex was already known. Then we need another complex to use as the second and we need the identity operator to map the first to the second. So that tells us what we should take for the first space. It's the second space at the top. So we're gonna use two copies of Hermit cubics for the first space on the bottom. And then 
You can use existing spaces to complete this to a nice complex. And these are elements that come from a variant of the Bretzi Douglas Marini elements that was uh, pioneered by Stenberg, who was trying to reduce the dimensions of the space by moving some of the degrees of freedom from the edges down to the vertices. And he gets the space that has extra uh, smoothness at the vertices. And the final space is the usual DG elements. Okay, and that was a long story, but the key thing is that these are two nice subcomplexes of the corresponding Duram complexes, and they have nice linking maps tying them up with the injectivity, surjectivity, and the anti commutativity conditions. So that means that we can do our construction and come up with a new complex, and here's the new complex that we come up with. It starts with our gyrus. It has a new space for the stresses and the ordinary uh, DG uh, quadratic space for the um, displacements. And it turns out as an elasticity element, this mixed elasticity element was already proposed by Jun Hu and Shang Yu Zhang, although they were using finite element exterior calculus, but not this DGG construction. And actually the first, uh, stable mixed finite elements for elasticity went back to Winter and I when we were first working on exterior calculus. And that can also be treated in a similar way. It's a little more complicated. So I've run out of time. I'll put a couple of the conclusions up here and you can read them during the question section. Let me see if there's any point I want to really make. Well, so you see the Hilbert complex is a rich structure with lots of implications that we need to discretize to get stable elements. This is a complete program pretty much for Duram. And now we have this BGG inspired construction to get to other complexes and we hope we can complete the whole program for the other complexes. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Duke, for this uh, talk. I have I have very naive question first. I, I want to know in the very first example you gave to motivate the uh, the eigenvalue problem that fails to to converge. Do, do, do you actually just to just to get a feeling the uh, in the other problem that so that that does a uh, does a finite as a standard finite element does it converge to the eigenvalue of something else? So the, the two examples, they both had showed non-convergence for eigenvalue problems, but they're different. They're failing for different reasons, both of which are addressed by phi. This one is failing. Well, the fact that it missed the zero eigenvalue could be, a, uh, say, a consequence of that it missed the cohomology. Mm -hmm. But more essentially, this is failing because of the re-entrant corner. So. Um, <clears throat> This bilinear form, it looks fairly coercive, and it is coercive over some norm, but the norm it's coercive over is H curl intersect H div. H curl intersect H div allows strong singularities, much stronger than H1 allows. And there is such a singularity at each of these re-entrant corners. And that singularity cannot be captured by an H1 function. In fact, H1 is a closed subspace of H curl plus H div. That's a result of another beautiful paper of Martin Costabelle. Mm -hmm. um, and so if you look carefully here, you see that red dot right around where I am, not the big red dot of my pointer, but the red dot below it. And the, the, that's a very strong singularity that's completely missed by here. I see. So basically, I believe that this is converging to the non-singular part of the solution, which of course is not the whole solution. It's the wrong thing. And there's nothing like that involved in this problem because this problem is on a square and everything's nice and smooth. This one is more clearly tied to stability issues. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Questions? I have a question. Yes, Volker, hello. Hello. Um, so when, when you put your PDE and you add constraints to the PDE, so, so that, the, for example, the dynamic flips on a manifold, and you enrich those uh, complexes with algebraic equations or 
something like Why that. Why do I have to enrich them? These complexes, well, I should be careful. The Duram complex is most naturally defined on a manifold without any additional structure, no metric yeah. or anything. Uh, once we get to the L2 Duram complex and we want to do Hodge theory, we need a Riemannian manifold. So we have a. No, that's not. That's not what I meant. I meant suppose you have contact between two bodies. Oh, contact. <clears throat> and and you want to um, want to parameterize that by a surface that that when when the two bodies have contact, they both are uh, touching this surface. So in this case, you would have to have an, an extra condition, which would be an algebraic condition. And, and the, usually either you get a singularity or you have to somehow enrich or, I mean, uh, let me say it differently. That would mean that, you're, that you have to project on a subspace and that may not have the right structure anymore. So my question is, is there a way to, to just put in, into these, these spaces extra, say, algebraic conditions? And I guess I don't know the answer. Um, of course. You can use finite element methods for contact problems in yes, several I know. different ways, like you're discussing. And these these are finite elements that you need for certain fundamental problems. If you build on those problems, I'm sure you still it's not going to make these other problems go away. I think having the, these mixed formulations with with these additional fields probably makes things easier to work with, but it certainly doesn't solve the problem. And I don't think I have anything smart to say about how to solve it. There's probably people in this audience who could say more than me. Well, there surely are. But... Thanks. OK, uh, there's a question uh, by Reza Baghdad, please. Hi, Doc. So, Hi, Reza. Hi, how are you? I'm doing OK. Uh, so my question. Uh, have you looked into? I mean, uh, well, I know that there are there are some nonlinear structures which are similar to these complexes. Say the divergence of cofactor metric gradients are zero, or in differential geometry, you see that uh, similar. Quite then regarding the curvature forms, you have some nonlinear structures which are quite. I, I don't say that they have the same nice structure, of course, because there is no linear operator there. But you have this chains of two operators which cancel each other out. So I wonder if you have looked into applying some sort of adaptation of these methods to those nonlinear situations where uh, some numerical approach can be more fruitful when you look at those. So That's a question that I certainly have thought about and interests me a lot. I don't have a great answer to it. As, as an example, you could start with nonlinear elasticity. I was doing linearized elasticity of course, I can make the easy answer, which is when you try to do numerics for a nonlinear problem, you often linearize as a key step along the way, and then you can apply this theory. But the question you ask is more interesting. Are, are there nonlinear <coughs> analogs of this structure, and do they also lead to improved numerics and so forth? There has been some work on that, and the guy who's done a, written quite a few papers on it is Yavari, from, I think from Georgia Tech. Um, there's a lot of structures and a lot of definitions. I'm not sure how, if, how impactful the results have been so far. Um, as you say, you can write down structures where you get, for example, the composition of operators is zero and things like that. Exactly. But I haven't seen how it all fits together and gives a beautiful theory, which is not to say that it doesn't. And I would love to see it, but I don't know how to do it. And I, I haven't seen it. The closest is this work of Yavari. Okay. Yeah, I was not expecting a neat theory as it is in, the, in your case, but at least some inspiration to get some numerical uh, efficient, met, say, uh, algorithm to tackle some of those problems which are quite involved. <laughs> 
Another problem that's of great interest to me and should tie to this a lot is uh, general relativity. Exactly. And the operators that come in from, so my case handles several different formulations of linearized GR, like the Einstein, the Einstein Bianchi formulation, that's a nonlinear thing, but it has a linearization that fits perfectly in one of these complexes that we have. How that can be carried over in the best way to nonlinear, uh, to the full relativity is I think an interesting open question. A lot of people are sort of thinking about, but I haven't seen a good answer yet. Okay. Okay. Uh, other questions? All right, so if not, I think, uh, well, thank you very much uh, to, uh, to Doug. And uh, so we, we close this seminar, but you can stay uh, and have a few uh, more informal uh, discussion. I'm stopping the recording and uh, we can uh, continue more informally. Okay, thank I'll stay. Thanks to everyone for coming.